This time we look at five big haul trail bikes from the 1970s. Before we start, don't forget to like and subscribe for more content. Now, the 1970s. It's the era when we begin to see large, big ball trail bikes for the first time. There had been some trail bikes, it's true, in the decades before, but they hadn't been quite so specialised and were usually modifications of basic road machines. The BSA Gold Star, for example, was developed into various off-road bikes, including the Catalina for the US market. But in the 70s, off-road bikes developed the look which we would instantly recognise today as a trail bike. So here are five of the very best. BSA B50 The BSA B50 was launched in 1971 but its lineage goes all the way back to the 1960s as one of the few bikes here that has a heritage that includes a World Motocross Championship. The machine's engine was a development of the C15 this has evolved through the Starfire, the B40 and the B44 Victor which despite its humble origins had given BSA Grand Prix success in motocross. B50 moved the game on even further. There was an all new race developed all bearing frame. The machine came in roads to form, trail form and of course full on Pucker motocross racing bikes. In fact mildly modded versions of the rather poorly named Gold Star 500 Roadster were used by the factory in endurance racing. Winning the 500cc class at the Fruxton 500, the Barcelona 24 hour and in fact winning the 24 hour race at Zolder outright. B50 SS Gold Star was a street scrambler designed specifically for the US market. Its choice of name though didn't really ingratiate it with the more traditional BSA Gold Star owners, while the B50T was designed specifically to meet the needs of the fast growing trail bike market. The B50 MX was the proper racer. Development of this bike would continue even after the demise of the company and CCM bought the designs and continued to use it for many years afterwards. The weak link in all this is probably the engine. It was quite simply a very old design. So the gearbox couldn't be modified to take 5 speeds and it had a tendency to oil leak. And of course it could be an absolute pig to start. But as we'll find, that's in no way unique to BSA. But even in road trim, the engine made good power, around 34 horsepower, and the chassis was years ahead of anything else. But unfortunately for BSA, even if they could squeeze a 5 speed gearbox in there, the B50 was very much a victim of circumstance, as the company as a whole went to the war, and only around 5,700 bikes were ever completed of this absolute fire-breathing monster. The Yamaha XT500 Arriving just a couple of years after the BSA went off the market, the XT500 arrived in 1975 and of course was in production for far longer than the BSA, finally going out of production in 1989. And indeed the design does owe a great deal to the BSA B50, having a dry sub motor with the oil stored inside the frame, just as BSA had done. Although of course being a modern Japanese bike, unlike the BSA, it ran a 5 speed gearbox and a single overhead cam, although also with just a two valve head. Of course by the 1970s big four strokes were no longer competitive in the world of motocross and in desert racing they were still extremely potent and in fact as the 70s wore on it would be very successful in the various African rallies that were then cropping up including most famously of course the Paris Dakar. The machine used a 21 inch front and 18 inch rear wheels. Ground clearance was adequate and this produced a machine which was a very decent off-road or trail bike. In keeping the example set by the BSA B50, the bike has that classic combination of good power, very mediocre brakes, and of course difficult starting when hot. I mean, what else would you expect from a big trailing bike of the 70s? The XT is very much the archetypal mid-70s trail bike, enjoying excellent sales throughout its life, despite really only evolving quite slowly. But there's no denying that the XT set the standards which all other trail bikes had to follow during the 1970s and even into the 1980s and beyond. The Ducati Scrambler 450. B50 
These days, when we hear the name Ducati Scrambler, we think of the 800cc V-twin. But the real story of the Scrambler goes back somewhat further than that, and back to the end of the 60s. By 1968, Ducati was already producing 250 and 350 Scramblers for the US market. But Joe Berliner, who was the importer for Ducatis into America, requested a larger machine to compete against BSA's B44 Victor. And the result, of course, was the 436cc single overhead cam 450 Scrambler. The finished machine hit the market in 1969, marketed as the 450 Scrambler, but also in the US known as the Jupiter, and in Europe as the 450 SCR. The overhead cam engine, of course, used a bevel gear for drive, but did not use desmodronic valves, instead using conventional valve springs to close the valves. The engine made around 27 horsepower, which is more or less in the same ballpark as the BSA Victor. But unlike the Victor, the Ducati used helical gears for its primary drive rather than a chain. And of course there was a 5-speed gearbox to boot. Unusually for a scrambler, the bike had excellent brakes. Unlike its BSA competitor, it would enjoy competition success, both on and off-road, being a particular favourite for dirt track riders in the United States. But Ducati as a company was much smaller than it is today. Consequently, the price of the machines was very high compared to the opposition from the UK and Japan. So not surprisingly, sales were fairly modest, with a total of around 11,000 machines being built between 1969 and 1974 when Ducati ended all single-cylinder production. Although even after this date, some machines would continue to be produced under licence in Spain by Motortrans. Today, quite a lot of these bikes remain in existence, but unfortunately, the bike has become a real cult classic. So you don't expect to pick up any bargains anytime soon. The Suzuki TS400. At the BSA, the TS400 evolved from a motocross competition stablemate. But while the BSA was a reputedly well-managed machine, the Suzuki was anything but, and was truly psychotic when you were trying to hang on to the thing. The machine had a homicidal combination of snappy, massive power delivery that came in like a hammer, terrible brakes and suspension, and a chassis which simply couldn't cope with the whole thing. Thankfully the road going version was somewhat better mannered. But that's not to say the bike didn't have its bite, and could be a real handful in inexperienced hands. The bike had evolved from a range of much smaller bikes, Suzuki gradually increasing the capacity of their two strokes throughout the 1970s. The first TS was a humble 185cc bike introduced in 1969. This was then supplemented by the TS250 and then on to the TS400 which would make its bow in 1971. The machine was a fairly conventional piston ported air cooled single cylinder motor. Of course it used automatic oiling and had a 5 speed gearbox. Claim peak power was 34 horsepower but it pretty much on a par with the 4 stroke opposition although of course the bike was much lighter. And despite being a 2 stroke it was generally easier to start hot or cold than its big four-stroke competitors. But unfortunately by the end of the 70s, the big two-stroke engine was becoming something of an anachronism. It was seen as out of date and out of step with the general feeling of the day that the two-stroke was a noisy, smelly, dirty hooligan of a machine that had well and truly had its day. And so in 1979, the TS400 was finally phased out, leaving the market open for big four-stroke signals. Honda XL500. Like all the other machines in this collection, the XL evolved from a series of smaller machines from earlier in the decade. In this case, the XL350 and 250 range. The XL500, in fact, did not make an appearance until 1979, so only just scrapes into the, our 1970s collection by the skin of its teeth. The XL may have been late to the market, but this was mainly because Honda had been watching and learning from what the other manufacturers were up to. So in a very Honda way, the all new XL of 1979 was more refined and better put together than any of the opposition. Still those brakes were still rather marginal drum brakes. Nobody could get discs to work properly in wet muddy conditions at that time. But the engine was extremely refined, employing a balance shaft, ensuring that vibration was minimal. And at the top end there was a four valve head operated by a single overhead cam. But despite the use of four valves, the engine only made around 32 horsepower 
So it was actually no quicker than a BSA from around a decade earlier, although of course it did have to cope with rather more stringent emission controls. Despite the use of a wet sump engine, ground clearance is very good. And all in all this is a very typical Honda. It's well thought out, well put together and very refined. And for the moment of its launch, it was regarded as the best, most advanced trail bike money could buy. At least from a major manufacturer that is. Into the 80s, the bike would gain monoshock rear suspension, thus improving travel and ground clearance, allowing the bike to perform even better off-road. But the decade would also see a gradual reduction in top-end horsepower in the face of ever tightening regulations. By the end of the 80s, however, time was pretty much up for the XL500, though interestingly, its engine survives today, being a common engine for use by Chinese motorcycles, especially in 400cc form. Well, I do hope you enjoyed our selection of big trailies. What other collections would you like to see on video? Or what machines would you like to see us do a single piece on? Or maybe you've got a bike that you'd like to see on video? Drop us a line in the comments below. I do hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, don't forget to like and subscribe. And of course, thank you very much for watching.